The last session of the day today is entitled Public Perceptions, Priorities, and Solar System Exploration. My name is Heidi Hamill. I am a planetary scientist. I am uh, pale, but I am not male, and I am not stale. This is the time for the women to take over the panels. I hope you notice that. So we are going to get into this here. Um, our first speaker today will be Linda Billings, who is a fellow at George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs right here in Washington. Um, she does communications research. She has her PhD in mass communication from Indiana University and quite a diverse uh, field of research, including science and risk communication, social studies of science, and the rhetoric of science and space. We've certainly been hearing some rhetoric today. Uh, she has a lot of experience um, in many different areas, including uh, lots of editorial work. And today, she will be talking to us about a very interesting scientific urban myth about the uh, presence of uh, materials in that have come back from the moon or, or not. So, Linda. Slides. to be cheated up. In the meantime, uh, for those of you watching on the web, uh, I want to say uh, that this is a story that depends on a lot of details. And I'm going to try to go back to my. There we go. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And the details are not going to be in my talk because we don't have a lot of time. But they are in my paper, and I will email the paper to anybody who wants to read it. Billingslinda1 at gmail.com. Billingslinda1 at gmail.com. And that goes for everybody in the audience as well. So my story is about a survivor or not, the story of S. Midas on the moon. S. Midas is Streptococcus Midas, a bacteria that probably all of us have uh, living in our mouths right now, and I'll get to that in a minute. The story of how NASA technicians found a viable Streptococcus mitis bacteria inside equipment retrieved from the moon and returned to Earth by astronauts has been replicated widely and reported as fact for decades. But it appears to be false, and I'm going to try to explain my case today. More than 30 years after the story was first told, in 1970, it may be difficult to prove it definitively true or definitively false. However, the evidence now points to false, in large part thanks to the unearthing of old visual records. I'll make the case that the claim that S. Midas traveled from Earth to the moon, returned to Earth, and came back to life in a lab does not qualify as scientific truth. This story has relevance to astrobiology, planetary protection, planetary exploration, and of course, the history and sociology of science. As most people know all too well, bacteria are hardy little buggers. The existence of extremophilic microbial life, an exotic concept just a few decades ago, is now common knowledge. We know that some microbes can form spores, dormant non-reproductive structures that enable them to survive harsh conditions. Thanks in part to 50 years of exobiology and astrobiology research, we know that microbes can thrive in virtually every sort of Earth environment known to science and that some can survive radical changes in environmental conditions for years, centuries, or some claim even longer. Meanwhile, planetary exploration has revealed that Mars and the Jovian moons Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto may have liquid water environments that could support life as we know it. Maybe Enceladus, too. We've heard about this from previous speakers. For missions to these targets, planetary protection, the practice of protecting solar system bodies from contamination by Earth life and protecting Earth from possible life forms that may be returned from other solar system bodies, has become a complicated enterprise. And John Sarkissian asked a question at the end of the last session uh, that related to planetary protection. And NASA's current planetary protection officer, Cassie Conley, is here to answer any questions about that. So let's get on with our story. Here are some, and dare I say it, facts about S. Midas. This bacterium is part of the oriflora of mammals. And there it is. I'll introduce you to it. It does not form spores. It lives optimally at temperatures between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius, which is 
approximately 85 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's commonly found in the human mouth. So think about this. Did S. Midas, could S. Midas, travel from Earth to the moon, survive more than two years of exposure there, only to revive once brought back to Earth? And why were scientists and engineers even thinking about such possibilities in the 60s and 70s? Even before NASA came to be, the international science community was discussing the possibility of ET life and steps that might be taken to prevent forward and back contamination. In the early days of Apollo, NASA planned for the quarantine of astronauts and material samples returned from the moon. A lunar receiving laboratory was built at the Manned Space Center in Houston, now Johnson Space Center, to contain and analyze lunar samples. I'm going to give you a little hint of the rest of the talk to come. In April 1967, NASA launched Surveyor 3 to the moon. It made a soft landing, operated for 14 days, then shut down, mission accomplished. Two years and seven months later, NASA launched Apollo 12 to the moon. On November 19, 1969, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean landed their lunar module about 163 meters away from where Surveyor 3 sat in the ocean of storms. On November 20, the astronauts retrieved several pieces of equipment from Surveyor, including its camera. They stashed the camera in a sample pack, zipped it shut, brought it back to the lunar module, stowed it on board, and took it home to Earth. The crew returned to Earth on November 24. Photos that splash down show they are not wearing their protective biological isolation garments. Once the astronauts were moved from their capsule to an aircraft carrier, they donned their protective garments and entered an isolation unit aboard the carrier. The pack containing the surveyor camera was retrieved from the capsule and delivered to the lunar receiving lab where it was stored at room temperature in a Teflon bag. On January 8, 1970, Lunar, re uh, lunar receiving lab personnel began examining the camera. Microbial analysis came first as soon as the camera was opened. Working in a clean room environment, they performed standard microbial assays, and after four days of incubation, one sample apparently produced viable, uh, visible microbial growth. The apparently microbladen sample had been taken from foam embedded inside the camera. The isolate was identified with confirmation from the U.S. Public Health Service as Streptococcus mitis. In March 1971, at the second Lunar Science Conference in Houston, this is where this slide comes in, the results of this analysis were reported and later published in conference proceedings. F.J. Mitchell, a U.S. Air Force major assigned to the Preventive Medicine Division of NASA's Manned Space Center, and R.H. Ellis, a contractor working at the center, claimed that the S. Midas that had been cultured in the lab had traveled to the moon on Surveyor 3, survived on the lunar surface for two and a half years, and once returned to Earth, revived and reproduced. This is a quote from their paper. Decontamination measures taken before the surveyor launch did not eliminate the possibility that the spacecraft carried organisms to the moon. They described the conduct of the Surveyor 3 camera, ana camera analysis in excruciating detail. Take my word for it, and I have a lot of those details in my paper. Another quote from their paper. The protocol established for the aerobic and anaerobic analyses contained a system of redundancy and cross-checks designed to identify suspected lab contamination. Only one sampled surface, a one cubic millimeter piece of foam inside the camera, produced visible microbial growth. Extreme precautions were taken at all times, they said in their paper, during the analysis to prevent any handling errors which might have caused contamination. The available data indicates their conclusion that S. Midas was isolated from the foam sample and suggests that the bacterium was deposited on the Surveyor 3 TV camera before spacecraft launch. At the very same meeting, M.D. Niddle, M.S. Favero, and R.H. Green presented a paper in which they reported on the results of their microbial sampling of returned Surveyor 3 electrical cabling. Niddle and Green were with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Favero was with the U.S. Public Health Department. Their findings raised some questions about Mitchell and Ellis' report. Now, keep in mind, these two papers were both presented at the same conference, and all these guys uh, knew each other. Niddle, Favero, and Green chose to examine a piece of electrical wire bundling running from the surveyor camera to another part of the spacecraft because earlier studies had shown that a high level of microbial contamination was associated with wiring bundles. 
if during the actual sampling of the wires they observed, and I'm quoting here, a contaminant were accidentally introduced, it would be impossible to separate it from a lunar survivor. Thus, it was necessary, they said, to perform several simulated assays with a piece of sterile wiring bundle before the lunar sample was assayed, which they did. Prior to opening the sealed container containing the Surveyor 3 cable and other parts, technicians discovered that it had leaked. There was concern whether airborne bacterial contamination of the exterior wraps would penetrate to the interior of the bundle. Their work in the lab showed that if airborne bacteria did pass into the container through the leak, the wiring bundle wraps would protect the wires beneath it from contamination. Their results showed, quote, that no viable microorganisms were recovered from that portion of Surveyor 3 cable that was sampled. The implication was that if no viable microbes were found on these protected wiring samples, then it would not be likely that any viable microbes would be found elsewhere on the camera. NASA published verbatim the findings of both Mitchell and Ellis and Niddle et al. as reported at the 1970 conference in a 1972 report. Here's a couple pictures of the camera and another picture. And thanks to John Rummel, who's now in the back of the room, uh, who got me started on this investigation, and then he'll come into the story pretty soon. In 1974, the prestigious peer-reviewed journal Annual Review of Microbiology published a paper by Jared Taylor of Johnson Space Center's Life Sciences Directorate, which he was formerly with the uh, Preventive Medicine Division there, that reported on advances in space microbiology. In this paper, Taylor cited the Lunar Science Conference papers by Mitchell and Ellis and by Niddle et al. In his text, however, Taylor described only the findings of Mitchell and Ellis as follows, quote, Components of the Surveyor 3 spacecraft, which had resided on the moon for 2.5 years, were returned during the Apollo 12 mission and analyzed for the presence of viable microorganisms, except for the presence of S. Midas, which was considered by the investigators to have been embedded within the camera body before it left the Earth. No viable microbes were recovered from any of the tested components." End quote. Over the next three decades, according to Science Citation Index, Taylor's paper was cited in 31 peer-reviewed journal papers in publications ranging from Icarus and Infection and Immunity to Microbiology and Molecular Biology Reviews, Microbiological Research, and Trends in Biotechnology. Meanwhile, in places ranging from NASA fact sheets, Wikipedia entries, and websites ranging from credible to dubious, the account of how Asmidas survived for 27 months on the moon and came back to life on Earth were widely reported as fact. After 30 years, somebody decided to look into the story. During his second stint as NASA's Planetary Protection Officer from 1998 to 2006, John Rummel, a microbial ecologist by training, decided to investigate the survivor claim. He talked with people knowledgeable about the surveyor camera analysis who had indicated that clean room procedures for the analysis were less than stringent. I began doing research for planetary protection in 2002. In a 2002 memo responding to a query from me about the story of S. Midas as a lunar survivor, which I'd stumbled across on the web in doing some routine research, Rommel said the claim is almost certainly incorrect. There was no peer-reviewed paper with that result at the time, nor has there ever been. Rummel told me that in 1998 he had gotten in touch with JPL Surveyor Project scientist Leonard Jaffe about the survivor claim and that Jaffe had told him there was a film of the procedure to sample the camera and that the samplers had broken sterile protocol inadvertently by placing their sampling tool outside the sterile hood. Jaffe passed along to Rummel a message he had received from his Surveyor Project colleague Richard Green, remember R.H. Green, of the Nittle, Favero, and Green paper about the LRL analysis of the Surveyor 3 camera. Green had told Jaffe, quote, you were correct. The sampling of the camera was suspect. I took movie film of the entire procedure and it shows up on it as well. I believe I still have the film somewhere in storage. If it would be helpful, I could try and find it. That's a long story too. At an astrobiology conference in 2004, Rummel discussed Mitchell and Ellis's S. Midas survivor claim and he asserted that the growth they had reported was the product of lab contamination, and he made a good case. A 2004 paper on biological contamination studies of lunar landing sites co-authored by Rummel and published in the International Journal of Astrobiology also challenged the claim in a similar fashion. 
In 2006, I began exploring the story of S. Midas on the Moon in earnest, searching the web for other accounts. On a NASA Goddard webpage, I found a following Science Question of the Week, provided by planetary scientist David Williams of NASA's National Space Science Data Center. The question, can anything from Earth live on the moon? The answer, yes. Scientists, uh, the, the S. Midas claim was reported here as fact, and quote from this webpage, scientists concluded that the S. Midas was inside the camera originally and had managed to survive on the moon. At the same time, I found a much more detailed account of the survivor story on a Marshall Space Flight Center website, Science at NASA, dated 1998 and headlined, Earth Microbes on the Moon, Three Decades After Apollo 12, A Remarkable Colony of Lunar Survivors Revisited. This account reports on, quote, an inadvertent stowaway, Streptococcus Midas, the only known survivor of unprotected space travel. How this remarkable feat of survival was accomplished only by strep bacteria remains speculative but the significance of a living organism surviving for nearly three years in the harsh lunar environment may only now be placed in perspective after three decades of the biological revolution in understanding life and its favored conditions. Talk about rhetoric. Another official NASA record found online, the Apollo 12 Lunar Surface Journal, Surveyor Crater and Surveyor 3, includes a transcript of astronauts Conrad and Bean's conversation while they were on the lunar surface, plus post-flight commentary from them and others in which they address the story of S. Midas on the moon. In post-flight comments, Conrad said, quote, the thing that had the bacteria in it was the television camera, the styrofoam in between the inner and outer shells. There's a report on that. I always thought the most significant thing that we ever found on the whole goddamn moon was that little bacteria who came back and lived and nobody ever said squat about it. Anyone who knows Pete Conrad would recognize that quote. And that quote was widely replicated, I, I think in large part because of its color. In his post-flight comments, journal contributor Ken Glover noted, quote, there is a distinct possibility that the microbes found in the Surveyor TV camera got there as a result of post-flight contamination. As of 2004, it seems generally accepted that the history of this particular microbe found in the Surveyor 3 parts will never be resolved. I also found, this is kind of disturbing, uh, a classroom teacher sheet for grades 9 through 12 called All About Microbes, developed for a NASA-sponsored project, which is now defunct, called NASA Explores. And it repeated this survivor story as fact, citing the Marshall website as its source of information. There were many, many other sources. And beyond the universe of NASA.gov, I found further accounts of the fact that S. Midas was a survivor at reference.com, at Wikipedia, on a space.com reader forum, many, many other places. In 2006, I began contacting people at Johnson Space Center who might know something about the surveyor camera analysis. Rummel told me Judy Alton, a curator with the JSC Astro Materials Office, reportedly had a list of film and photographic records of the analysis, so I first contacted her. She found her handwritten list, provided it to us, uh, her colleague, Carlton Allen, referred us to John Lindsay with the Lunar and Planetary Institute Center for Advanced Space Studies for help with our investigation. Lindsay advised that he was, quote, part of the preliminary examination team on Apollo 12, so have some feel for the way things went and would enjoy working on the data once again. I put my research on hold in late 2006 when Rummel stepped down as Planetary Protection Officer to take over the NASA Astrobiology Program. In 2008, Rummel left NASA and John Lindsay passed away, unrelated events. Nonetheless, Rummel still seemed determined to prove, if possible, that S. Midas survivor was actually S. Midas lab contamination. Ultimately, Rummel Alston and Don Morrison completed an investigation into the matter, and Rummel reported their results at a workshop in 2011. Rummel said that according to NASA records, the Surveyor 3 camera reached a maximum temperature of around 70 degrees Celsius on the moon. NASA records also showed that S. Midas, quote, was isolated from the Apollo 12 crew in routine microbial testing. The team's investigation verified that no viable microbes were isolated from the Surveyor 3 cables or foam or from any Apollo surface samples, excuse me, returned to Earth, and that no viable microbes were isolated from 10 of 11 sampling locations, 32 of 33 samples within the camera body. What clinched the TRIO's investigation, however, was that in 2010 they found the 16 millimeter film records of the 1970s Surveyor camera analysis. Quote, in, in John, John's words, languishing in Maryland. All three researchers viewed and analyzed the film, and again, in John Rummel's words, it wasn't pretty. 
The film showed lab technicians working in short sleeves with only their mouths and noses covered by masks. At some points, they were working with bare hands. As Rummel observed, after all of that, how can you be sure where your microbes came from? More specifically, Morrison pinpointed an anomaly in camera foam sampling, which I've detailed in my paper. As to general protocol, Judy Alton noted, I will add that the participants were wearing short sleeve scrubs, thus arms were exposed. Also that the scrub shirt tails were higher than the flow bench level and would act as a bellows for particulates from inside the shirt. On May 2, 2011, Space.com reported on Rommel et al.'s findings, describing the story of S. Midas' survivor as a long-lived bit of Apollo moon landing folklore that now appears to be a dead-end affair. Ooh, I missed some slides. Now here's a lovely picture. It's a little blurry because, of course, this is a still, still imagery taken from 16-millimeter film, but you can see and get a good idea of what we're talking about here. The contestation, or shall we say refutation, of Mitchell and Ellis' claim has had some effect on the public record so far. While in 2006 I found numerous websites replicating the story of S. Midas' survivor, in 2012 I found only a few that were sticking with the story. In 2006 I had contacted David Williams at Goddard to advise that the claim he reported as fact was contested. In 2012 I looked for this page and it no longer exists. In 2012 at reference.coms, online entry for Surveyor 3 at the very same URL that I checked in 2006, I found a completely different story about S. Midas on the moon. And now this story reported that the claim of S. Midas surviving on the moon and coming back to life on Earth has been cited as providing credence to the idea of interplanetary panspermia. However, NASA officials now no longer support this claim. Now. I believe even today, because I just checked this about a week ago, NASA Marshall's Science at NASA entry of 1998 has not been revised since it was posted there. Thus, in 2012, at least one NASA.gov webpage continues to report without question or qualification that S. Midas did indeed survive for two and a half years on the moon, come back to Earth, and come back to life. So we'll, it remains to be seen. We'll have to wait a few more years to see how long it will take to correct the public record. It's still with us. On the September 14 edition, just last month, of National Public Radio Science Friday show, Ira Flato asked Cassie Conley, NASA's current planetary protection officer, about the bioassays of the surveyor camera parts. And Cassie said, quote, it turns out that the way they were taking those samples was about the same level of sterility as you do in surgery. So they had short sleeve scrubs, they didn't really have good masks, so the samples that were contaminated were taken at the very end of this whole sampling process, and just after somebody breathed right on that location on the camera. So it probably was contamination after the camera was brought back. And there's another picture, just to show up close and personal. To wrap up, this story shows how a claim became a widely accepted fact without passing the conventional test of peer review, how initial counterclaims that challenged the status of the first claim as fact failed to register, how a later and perhaps more vigorous counterclaim ultimately led to a solid case against the first claim, and how consequently the first claim is losing its status as fact, I think. Rommel et al. are interested in this story as a case that illustrates the importance of stringent compliance with planetary protection policy and procedures. And as we've heard from other speakers, in recent years, microbiology research has revealed the extent to which humans are teeming with microbial life and the prospect of sending humans to extraterrestrial environments that might be habitable for Earth life greatly complicates the task of compliance with planetary protection requirements. NASA clean room practices have evolved considerably since the days of the surveyor analysis where clean room technicians wore short sleeves to the present day planetary protection requirement of bunny suits. There you go. I think this was from Genesis, John, is that right? The Genesis crew? Today the scientific consensus is that it is not likely that terrestrial microbes could survive and thrive on the moon and this consensus is reflected in planetary protection policy for missions to the moon which designates those missions category two forays to a body of significant interest relative to the process of chemical evolution and the origin of life, but where there is only remote chance that contamination carried by a spacecraft could compromise future investigations. For Category 2 missions, forward contamination is not a concern. However, there is a concern that in extraterrestrial environments where liquid water might exist, and we've discussed many of them today, 
it could be possible for terrestrial microbes to thrive and replicate. And then forward contamination for missions to those targets is a serious concern and planetary protection requirements are strict. So for planetary protection, this case illustrates, among other things, that microbes are everywhere, at least on Earth. Clean room procedures for microbial assays can't be too careful, and meticulous and complete records of such procedures must be made and preserved. For astrobiology, this case illustrates how difficult it will be to verify any claims of the detection of extraterrestrial life, something else we've been talking about today. Consider the Mars Science Laboratory, NASA's first astrobiology mission to Mars since Viking now roving around Gale Crater, seeking evidence of habitability. Questions will continue to arise from the press and the public and the science community about the possibility of finding life on Mars or in other extraterrestrial environments. And how will we ever know for sure? For the history and sociology of science, this case shows how a claim that was never subjected to formal peer review became and remained a fact for decades before it was seriously challenged and how it took visual evidence to finally make the case that multiple sources had made verbally. It shows how the paper trails that we researchers like to excavate for information are now intermingled with digital documentation that can be altered at any time without leaving any detectable evidence of an alteration. And it shows something that historians already know, that the record is never complete. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Linda? Have you? Know you yeah, I bet. He, and he showed me innumerable extremophiles that, that he has collected all around, and I wonder what his comments were on this. I did not speak to him for this particular paper because his name did not show up. Oh. Yeah, I, this pillar is getting away. Uh, I did not speak to him doing research for this uh, particular paper because his name did not show up in any of these he, records. He just retired from NASA, but yes. he's still active, so you yes. might want to do that. Yes. There are lots and lots of people, I'm sure historians in the audience realize uh -huh. how much more I can do to fill out this story. This is just scratching the surface. I did not sit down and do a formal interview with anybody. I mean, I had some thank conversations you. on the phone and well, email I bet correspondence. I'd love to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, w I will point out that it is possible for Streptococcus mitis to survive on the surface of the moon for two and a half years if an astronaut is willing to stay on the surface of the moon <laughs> for two and a half years. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Linda. Uh, your talk is uh, very instructive indeed, and uh, this is showing, um, well, how easily the different microbes adapt to the hostile environment. In this regard, I just would like to ask you, you know, we try to sterilize many Martian missions which we send. Okay, but it's impossible to sterilize for reliably, completely, and some of them crashed when just landing on Mars. So the microbes possibly re easily adapted to the natural environment on Mars, and even in the dynamical, very dynamical conditions in the Martian atmosphere, just easily proliferated over the Martian, that the whole globe. So the question is whether we need to take care about sterilization for the future mission. What we are going to find out? Some kind of the mutations or just completely original terrestrial life forms? What do you think about that? It's, it's a serious challenge in the search for evidence of life elsewhere to know whether it's life we've never seen before or life that used to be like us that, as you mentioned, might have evolved, changed, mutated. Uh, th this is why the more we learn about um, planetary environments, potential habitability, and the more we learn about life, as, as David Grinspoon and others have discussed today, um, and how, how weird life really is. I mean, <laughs> it's just amazing to me. It's mind-blowing to me. I'm not a biologist, obviously. Um, the, the more difficult it will be for us to determine how to make sure that when we send that uh, melter, who showed the slide of the, the nuclear, oh, that was last melt night probe. at National Geographic, the melt probe, yeah, through the, the icy surface of Europa, uh, that if we find anything it, there, it's not something that we brought with us. It's an extremely, extremely difficult challenge to meet. We have, I see 
Vicki Hipkin, who's uh, the queen of planetary protection for the Canadian Space Agency, she's biting her lip, you know, so <laughs> it's a very, very hard job to do, but people are, are working at it. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. My only comment about that, Linda, is that, you know, somehow your work has been able to get this out of the web, and why can't they get rid of the story about the Mars being, you know, the size of the full moon out, which comes around every August, like clockwork. If you could work on that one next, I'd really appreciate it. Um, our next talk by William McCauley, um, Instant Science, Space Probes, Planetary Exploration, and Televisuality, unfortunately had to be withdrawn. There were visa troubles uh, for uh, William McCauley, and he can't be here. But his paper is quite interesting, and if you are interested in the use of visual imagery in space, the history of how visual imagery came to be such a big part of this space program, I suggest that you do track that paper down because it is a very interesting read. And our next topic is one that's near and dear to my heart because I happen to be in charge of the Hubble Space Telescope in 1994 when a comet, fragmented comet, Shoemaker-Levy 9, crashed into Jupiter, creating massive explosions on the planet, uh, which was headline news for a full week. Um, and how, how many of you saw that? I'm just curious. Yeah, a lot of you did. And that comes into the next story, which is entitled Killer Asteroids. Popular Depictions and Public Policy Influence by Laura Delgado Lopez. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge that this paper came as a collaboration between myself and Dwayne Day from the NRC, whom you've heard um, earlier this morning. And um, so now let's just move right on to it. Killer asteroids. We know the story so well. Basically, we find out, usually by pure chance, that, this, that a monstrous asteroid is heading, you know, hurling toward the planet and is threatening civilization. And, you know, do we have time to do anything? Can we do anything about it? And so the story goes and Bruce Willis, you know, makes an appearance or something. Um, but what we may not know is that this narrative is actually, um, goes back much further than we may believe. And so when we look at all these examples, some of which I will mention today, um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is behind this narrative? Was it prompted by real events? Can it tell us anything about um, real policy impacts or um, public opinion about it? And so to begin with, I'll tell you a little bit about the long and explosive history. Um, and in the paper, which you may have an opportunity to see, um, there is a there's a list at the end of a bunch of examples that we were able to find, some in other languages, as you see here. Um, but just to show that this uh, has been around a long time. Um, the earliest example we found was a French novel published in 1890, titled La Fin du Monde. And it was republished again in the 30s and made into a movie in the 90s. Um, and it was, again, one of the very earliest examples. And also at the time, at the time, you know, we see the 40s, the 50s, also some other movies and books exploring the issue. Um, in nonfiction, we see some work looking at asteroids, comets, and other planetary bodies, you know, as a threat of, of a potential impact and what that meant. Um, and so, what those early events, many of them came as a result of, probably came as a result of an early impact event um, in the 20th century, the 1908 Tunguska impact in Siberia. There are literally hundreds of works, both fiction and nonfiction, exploring exactly what happened there. And even as far back as, um, excuse me, as recently as 2010, in the National Research Council report um, on, on asteroids and near-Earth objects, um, more recent research of, of what it is that happened that day was actually come, come, to, be, come to bear. Um, other important events that kind of help drive these um, narratives um, include the 1980 Alvarez hypothesis that for the first time linked the cataclysmic events that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs with an asteroid impact. And as, as um, Heidi mentioned, the 1994 shoemaker leaving 9 impact that, again, captured the attention of the world. And so as a result, particularly in the 90s, we see so many, so many of these examples, over 25 in our survey alone. 
Um, also, during that time, um, planetary research had a role to play because um, the research that from, from several of the spacecraft that we had sent out were just confirming the role that impacts have had in transforming not just the face but also the composition of other planets. And also that um, it became clear that our own planet had had impacts before and that those things were not just a thing of the past, that they could continue happening. Um, they continued. These examples continued. I think um, events such as uh, the debate over the non-negligible possibility of impact of asteroids such as Apophis or AG5 helped feed the sustaining narrative. There's also the um, misinterpretation of the Mayan prophecy that the world was going to end in 2012. That prompted more examples even um, this year in 2012. And so this survey and um, some of the examples that I've selected here are not exhaustive. I'm sure that if we keep looking, we will find more examples in um, maybe in other languages and other countries. But just to show that this was not born with Armageddon and Deep Impact, which are the examples that very easily come to mind. Um, but in fact, it's a narrative that has been very present throughout history and that was just strengthened by these um, events that captured the attention of the world. And so um, science fiction Studies research will suggest to us that if we see a sustaining narrative, it should tell us something about real, deep-rooted perceptions in the public. And so if we look at all of these examples, we have to ask ourselves, well, um, are people really concerned about asteroid impacts? And the fact is they're not. At least, um, <laughs> at least what little research exists on the subject that has asked this very question, um, the first one, then maybe the first one of its kind, in 1993, Slovak and Peterson made a survey of 200 grad students, and they asked them to rank um, their, their risks in terms of concern. And um, impact risks ranked 24, and were dis it, excuse me, 14 out of 24, and were described as distant in time and um, non-immediate. And that result continued um, even in a survey that was performed by a Pew Research Center in 1999 and, and again in 2012 with almost identical results. The majority of the people surveyed um, described it as something that will probably not happen or will definitely not happen. And so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, where, why is that contradiction there, you know? If, if, why does that narrative keep occurring if we, if it finds an indifferent public. And so for that, I think that we have to see, we have to look at what kind of threat we're talking about. And first, we have to consider the uniqueness of the threat. Um, if we look again at Paul Slovak's research on risk assessment, and they've developed a, a matrix where um, there's a, a couple of variables, including um, dread risk and unknown risk that help rank um, risk risk assessments of, of the public towards specific issues. And we see that asteroid impacts would be described very highly by all of these characteristics, you know, uncontrollable, indiscriminate, catastrophic consequences, unknown to science. And that is how it is continually presented in a dominant narrative. It is captured as very risky and catastrophic. And as Slovic um, accurately describes, it has a unique combination of very low probability and very great consequence. In addition, um, the threat is also the more compelling because it is always presented as urgent. Even though we've been surveying asteroids for many decades, it always is just hiding behind the moon or, you know, it's, it's you know, we can't see it. We only find out about it um, months or weeks or hours before it's um, supposed to impact the planet. Um, another element that's interesting is the tools that we use to tell that story, the tools of the trade. And so I think that this, this threat is particularly visually appealing. And um, with the advancements in visual arts and in special effects and the CGI, what was in the 90s something that was very surprising that we could we were very impressed as an audience that movie, um, movie makers could do, became an expectation in the, in, the, in the 2000s and afterwards. And so at now at this point, with relatively little cost, you can make pretty impressive imagery of the asteroid, um, you know, the track and, and that moment of impact. And interestingly, um, you can keep going with that because what happens after the, if the impact happens? I think the asteroid threat presents a lot of opportunities for um, developers, particularly in film, 
to showcase advanced special effects that are not presented by other natural disasters, such as earthquakes or um, hurricanes. Um, and, and, and that's just worth a mention. You know, even in nonfiction works, like um, documentaries, like this one, titled Mega Disasters, um, asteroids are not the only thing that's discussed in that, in that documentary, but they still made the cover. And so even in books, you have that. Maybe the asteroid impact happens in five pages, but you know, it's compelling enough that you will put it on the, on the cover. And then the third element is, I think, the reason why we're here today is to draw out space. The fact that the threat comes from space is very powerful. Um, as uh, McCurdy notes in his book, Space and the, Ameri and the American Imagination, he talks about how space um, became entrenched to the American imagination, particularly after the Second World War. And so the idea that both threats and salvation would come from space was very compelling. And I think that that has continued since then. I think um, you know, all of these elements together make for a very compelling, if unbelievable, threat. Um, and so, again, with we see, you know, taking this light and the previous light together, we see its narrative that has continued, but all of these elements together, and particularly the tools of the trade, um, and the opportunity to make this narrative even more entertaining, even more um, um, amazing visually, just has this feedback loop continuing and so you know there's almost no end we will pro probably continue seeing even more examples about it so we have that explained we we kind of understand now why we keep seeing it but we still understand why people are not concerned about it when they think about the issue and so for that i think we have to look at how the story is represented it's depicted and you know, why is it not believable and why is this giggle factor that the scientists would usually bemoan still alive? Well, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Cliches like that are particularly common in this kind of movie. With few exceptions, asteroid impact narratives make for decidedly unsuccessful movies, often only made watchable by the special effects used to image the asteroid and its, its path of destruction. There's narrative, narrative gaps, there are incorrect scientific and technological assumptions, predictable storylines, you can keep going. And so these are some of these. Um, one of them is, for example, incorrect science and technology. And I'm sure when you're in the audience as well, you start naming all of these using the space shuttle to go to the asteroid and you know, deploy the nuclear weapons. Um, another one that's interesting is this inflated NASA role. It's interesting to me that in the real world, when we talk about the possibility of an asteroid impact and what do we do, there's all of these discussions about, you know, is it DOD? Is it, um, Department of Energy, is it NASA, is it all that together? What happens with other countries? You know, do we want to cooperate with them if we want to um, solve this issue? None of that, none of that is in the main narrative. You know, NASA is automatically the source of the solutions and they have this amazing budget that they can just take care of. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's fiction, but... Um, so a third element that, again, is also very interesting is this focus on science's limitations. You know, again, despite the fact that we've been surveying asteroids for decades, um, the asteroid is always a surprise. In Deep Impact, for example, the asteroid is found out by a 12-year-old with a not impressive telescope, not by a ground observatory, not by an academic institution, not by NASA, it's by a kid with a telescope. So, um, and then you see that also as well with the kind of fumbling with how do, what do we do about it, do we even know what's going on. Um, and then finally, and I, and I think this is a very important point too, is that Asteroids are not the focal point of the, of the story. Um, they are the cover to discuss a lot of other issues, namely um, American values, the true nature of things. You know, when, when crisis comes, you see the true nature of people, that kind of thing. And so I think as a result, um, there is no requirement from either the movie makers or from us, the audience, to have an accurate depiction of asteroids because the movies are not about that. And so when you think of Again, Armageddon, you think about that scene that has been recreated in countless movies. You don't think about the asteroid as the main, main character um, in that movie. And so what comes to mind for us in the audience is not a film about a threat that should concern us, but one where individual characters and their successes and failures and a lively scene or two of destruction are the focal point. Again, believable enough to keep us entertained, but not to wake us up at night. Now, in contrast to that, we have our scientific understanding of, of the threat. 
And um, while the public is entertained but are unconcerned, the scientific community has been preoccupied with, it, with the issue for at least three decades. And I'll go very briefly through this, but um, this idea that impacts constitute a contemporary hazard did not emerge until the end of the 20th century, so we're not looking at a very long history. But, um, and it was, as Chapman and Morrison described, even deemed a curiosity before this. But again, these catalysts, you know, the 1980 hypothesis, 1994 Shoemaker-Levy, planetary research, it um, motivated a more urgent appeal to look at this issue. So in, 1990, in 1981, NASA sponsored the Space Watch workshop. Um, in the 90s, we have the Space Guard Survey, which was the first um, comprehensive survey of um, asteroids over larger than one kilometer in diameter. And, and that kind of snowballed and, you know, the, the government, the U.S. government in particular, has taken um, consistent steps to understand the issue more. And there's about $4 million in, in funding that go to this issue annually. Now, as a result of all of this, our scientific understanding of the issue has advanced greatly. So much, in fact, that, as Morrison says, astronomers have already assured us that we are not due for an extinction-level impact from an asteroid within the next century. Barring an unlikely strike by a large comet, we are not about to go the way of the dinosaurs, so you can breathe easy. Um, but that is in sharp contrast with the dominant narrative. You know, were you to watch the movies only by themselves, you would think that, you know, this is likely going to happen. And so, um, you know, as, as Morrison says, asteroids do not, except in Hollywood, change orbits capriciously. And that's because this, this narrative that we've just talked a little bit about ignores this, uh, this element of predictability. You know, in, in science, we understand that chances are we understand enough of the orbits of the larger um, asteroids that we don't need to be concerned about those, about those. In fact, we are now concerned about the sub-kilometer items, not the larger ones. But that, that element of predictability and that nuance of how different sizes of items could have different consequences completely lost in film, and particularly in film, um, but in general in, in fiction. Um, another element that's, that's, that's lost is, is this tied to the idea that we've put aside the major threat. And there's no sense of panic. If you read, for example, the NRC report, it, it says, and I quote, and it's right there, the time required to mitigate optimally is in a range of years to decades, but this long period may require acting before it is known with certainty that an NEO will impact Earth. And so the arguments are for funding the sub-kilometer survey called for in 2005 and for exploring new technologies to identify smaller objects, and they are rooted in the desire to continue to dispel the threat and give us decades or centuries to get ready for an eventuality. But as you can see, it's a very different scenario from what is the main focal point of the dominant narrative. So this mismatch exists between public and scientific perception of the issue. And um, it helps explain why, despite the concerted efforts of prominent scientists to foster public concern and understanding of the issue, the public is not an active player in lobbying for what could be construed as the biggest threat the world could ever face. And there are many, many reasons to help explain this, um, which I won't go into today, but I think that the link to education is interesting, and this is what I want to leave you with. Um, because many, many of the authors say that, well, if we want the public on our side, we have to design a very aggressive educational campaign where they can understand the issue, and um, chances are that they are just not as aware of impacts and impact threats um, as we are. But I would argue that that situation is no longer true. Um, you know. If you did not watch that great science documentary on asteroids, you probably sat through Armageddon and Deep Impact and Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Or so, you know, culturally, we are aware of the threat. So I think the idea that um, the public just doesn't know about it no longer applies. I think there are other reasons that help explain why the public is not as concerned. And so I think that's one of the assumptions that needs to be questioned. The other one is, um, this idea that improved education would lead to greater policy relevance um, and that Hollywood and these films and these stories have a role to play in advancing that education. Um, Hartwell says, scientists owe a great debt of, of gratitude to the Hollywood blockbuster and that's something that I would question. I think that um, 
what we may be what we may have seen is that these depictions only demonstrate the perpetuation of a specific view of the asteroid threat that is removed from a current scientific understanding of the issue and therefore its real risk and so um, I would leave you with just thinking that more research on public attitudes would probably be very helpful and also considering the lessons from fields such as risk assessment um, to understand and to inform educational, pro edu educational efforts that are aimed at having a real public policy impact. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. I realized that I forgot to read the bio, but I want to make sure that it's you know. It's not long. No, it's not long, so I'm going to read it right now so that you all know who Laura is. Um, she, is the, uh, she is the Earth Observations Associate at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, and she's also a correspondent for spacepolicyonline.com and a recent graduate, like almost everyone in the room, it seems, of George Washington University Space Policy Institute. Questions? Torrance. Uh, just a comment. It is a very interesting study. I uh, appreciated it. I used to talk about the public perception problem with uh, Gene Shoemaker quite a bit. And uh, one take on this, obviously, is that humans have a hard time relating to threats that happen very infrequently on the time scale of the human lifetime. That's something that everybody that deals with this is. And it's interesting, just as a comment, to consider a, a, a thought experiment that in 1906, the San Andreas decided to break down in Coalinga instead of San Francisco. And the object that hit Tunguska was on a slightly different trajectory and took out downtown Moscow. We might have a different public perception. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, and, and that's something that you find a lot in the research, your first comment about how, you know, and, and you see it, you know, there's a big spike in interest after a real event, after an impact, after the discussion on the media that an asteroid may hit the planet, and then it wanes. And I wouldn't necessarily think that that's, um, that's a bad thing because that's, that's in our nature. I mean, the public responds that way, but policymakers respond that way. And I think scientists respond that way, too, because, um, you know, we can be concerned about every single threat all the time. And so it's just, it's just one more challenge we have to deal with. Uh, Marsha Freeman with the EIR magazine. <clears throat> it doesn't help me sleep too much better at night to know that scientists think that it'll be 100 years before there's a big impact. Um, I think we need to know a lot more than we know. And th uh, there's a very interesting proposal. I was wondering if you knew about it or had any thoughts about it uh, that the Russians have made over the last year. Uh, it's part of uh, the larger proposal. Uh, it was actually by uh, General Permanov, who had been the head of the Russian space program, uh, which is for a whole global uh, coordination between global threats to Earth. It certainly includes something coming in here from somewhere else, but even the kinds of things that have large-scale impacts in terms of tsunamis, uh, extreme weather events, which can affect a lot of countries, et cetera. And then a sort of more uh, confined proposal for what's been called the strategic defense of Earth. Now, there are a lot of individual programs through the United Nations. You mentioned the U.S. programs. But really to bring this together in more of a global effort and to give it, you know, to take away a little bit of the giggle factor, as you mentioned, you know, and to say this is a scientific project that concerns us all globally and the world scientists are working on it. That's a great point. I am aware of it. And I think that, again, that shows a, a whole very interesting discussion that is missing from the dominant narrative, I think you would make a great film talking about how the different countries um, and, the, and the proposals that they have and whether they'll be successful or not. Um, another point is that, and that's, that's kind of one of the comments that I, that I meant to, to kind of suggest in my, in my very fast um, presentation, is that you know, we understand that even sub-kilometer um, impacts would, would have damage, particularly depending on where they fall. You know, if they if they fell in certain locations, you know, in big cities, they, they would have a legitimate um, and very an impact of a lot of concern. And so it's interesting that that is missing from the popular discussion because I think it, it is something that the public would be interested in. Hey, Laura. 
So uh, one of the slides uh, had a dollar figure of about $4 million for tracking uh, Earth uh, or near-Earth asteroids, uh, which I know is probably about 2% of the budget of the movie Armageddon. Uh, but I noticed uh, <laughs> you also had another slide that showed uh, statistics talking about the public perception and saying that, that, that you know, large percentages view this as, as a very low uh, uh, concern. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the public uh, opinion drives the policy on that, that drives the, the, the low amount of funding? Do you think that perhaps the, the low amount of funding is the reason that the public is less concerned, or do you think that the two are detached? Um, no, I don't think, I don't think that public, um, public concern drives it. Um, I think in this case, the public and the policymakers are in the same side of the table. And so, like you said before, their interest is spiked by, by real events, and they do put more funding in it. But then, when it's not, well, you know, other priorities take precedence. And so, I don't, I don't see, I don't have any solutions to how you solve that. I think what the NRC is doing and what some in the community are doing are saying, you know, sub-kilometer impacts, we need to survey those, we need to fund what Congress asked for in 2005 um, to, to survey those, those um, objects is, is good, but I think that Bearing that very present and clear thread, there's not going to be that much attention given to it. Thanks. We'll have time for questions later, so if Lindley and you can save your questions for the, for the panel, we will we'll certainly have time for that. But we do want to make sure we get all our presentations in. I just have a question. I, I want to take it, not for you, but you can answer it too. A survey. How many of you have ever seen a shooting star? All right. So you have seen an asteroid impact the Earth. You already have. So the statistics about 62% of the people don't think it's like going to happen, but it happens all the time every night. It's just a question of whether it's a really big one or not, all right? I know, and that's the point. She says people think of them as shooting stars. They don't understand what an asteroid impact really is because they have a Hollywood impression, and they don't realize that asteroid and comet impacts happen every single day. And it's just a question of degree. All right, so that's something that we need to communicate a little bit better, I think, uh, that we aren't just talking about a one-off dinosaur killer. The Tunguska event I like to show superposed on Washington, D.C. because it encompasses, the tree fall pattern in Tunguska encompasses all of Metro Washington, D.C. So it's just something to keep in mind. Good to show your Congress people. All right, our last presentation before the panel discussion is by Jenny Chiang, and she is a doctoral candidate in the Department of History and Ar Art History at George Mason University. She's working on her PhD, which will also be looking at questions of public perception and the mass media during several more of NASA's science missions than are mentioned in this talk, um, which is entitled Voyager, exploring through the public eye, but I know she's going to talk about more than just Voyager. All right, so how the public gets information has certainly evolved over the last 30 years. In the 1970s, the public relied on newspapers for information, and television featured only three major networks. Focusing on newspapers, the Voyager mission illustrates the process of how the mass media disseminated scientific discoveries to the public. The Voyager mission sent twin spacecraft to take advantage of an outer planetary alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that occurs approximately once in every 175 years. Voyager 1 launched on August 1977, arrived at Jupiter in March 1979, and then Saturn in November 1980. I'll also examine the media coverage for Galileo's mission's return to Jupiter in 1995 and Cassini's return to Saturn in 2004. I'm hoping to show you a few of the significant changes in science communication through the evolution in mass media, as well as hint at what's happening in the public attitudes towards science. Press releases and press briefings acted as a conduit for journalists to gain information about a mission. The major newspapers published stories written usually by consistent journalists on the staff that followed space news. 
The articles carry different tones according to the writer's style and readership, and often the more entertaining ones popularize the science. What do I mean by popularizing science? Los Angeles Times science writer George Alexander provides an excellent example in his article for Voyager 1's arrival at Jupiter, published on March 1, 1979. He starts the article, like a sailboat cresting a reef and entering the lagoon of some Pacific island, the Voyager 1 spacecraft passed through the bow shock of Jupiter Wednesday and slipped inside the big planet's magnetic environment. The simile makes a real-world connection to something most may have difficulty imagining and goes on to further explain the bow shock. It also hints at the risks inherent to the spacecraft before it successfully reaches its destination. Popularization isn't perfect. I'm sure that sailors or engineers might point out that the problems in making this analogy. However, these stories usually contain understandable writing analogies as well as enthusiasm, which relates to a wider public audience than the audience that's already interested in learning about things like this. During the planetary encounters, the media coverage shifted from the planned science objectives to the actual scientific discoveries and images. The press releases and briefings increased in technical and scientific detail. Science journalists, however, compensated for the detail by imbuing emotional values, surprise and wonder, to the news and personifying the science whenever possible through quotes and interviews. Newspapers also chose to emphasize articles through their placement within the publication, such as the front page or special sections. Although the mass media could not obtain their own images using photographers like most other earthly news events, Editors determine space and placement for the dramatic images, like this one of Jupiter's great red spot. Here are a couple examples of headline news. The first one to the left and the middle one are from the New York Times, both by John Noble Wilford. The first published on Sunday, March 4th, 1979. And the middle one on March 6th, 1979, which is a Tuesday. The one on the right is from the Washington Post, also on March 6th. Voyager images appear on the front page of these newspapers, drawing readers to continue the story inside. If you note the, f the first image and the second image, you really only get the image, and you don't get much of the story. You have a caption, and it tells you to keep reading inside. It's only the one on the right where you start getting the first few paragraphs of the story and continue it inside. The other headlines on the page will include President Carter's mediation of a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel and China's withdrawal from Vietnam. John Noble Wilford had a remarkable career at the New York Times since 1965, and although retired as a senior science correspondent, still writes about science news today. Wilford has a more informational style in his reporting. He uses simple description combined with facts, like the robot spacecraft sped within 174,000 miles of the multicolored clouds of Jupiter and with its television cameras looked deep into the eye of the huge hurricane-like feature known as the Great Red Spot. Wolford uses quotes as a vehicle for emotion, such as citing, We've had a total success, exclaimed Dr. Edward C. Stone, the project's chief scientist at the press conference. He also quotes Dr. Bradford Smith from the University of Arizona, saying, when he displayed the latest color photograph of the disk of Io with its deep reds and yellow and a mingling of dark spots, he joked, that's better looking than a lot of pizzas I've seen. Thomas O'Toole repeats the same quotes by Dr. Stone and Dr. Smith, which reminds me that sound bites aren't exclusively found in television. O'Toole emphasizes the mysteries beguiling scientists, especially Jupiter's moon Io, which he quotes Dr. Lawrence A. Soderblom, of the U.S. Geological Survey, saying as one of the strangest bodies in the solar system. These articles emphasize the newness of the color images, despite being republished in black and white medium, the questions raised by prior research on ground-based telescopes that might get answers, and the new questions still yet to be addressed. The newspaper editorials generally seem to agree that this exploration holds some fundamental value for humanity. As the Los Angeles Times editorial so eloquently states, like monkeys in a dark box, we use Voyager as a window into the blackness of space. We want to see what's out there. From the standpoint, the exploration of space is no high-priced public relations gimmick 
or cockeyed race with the Russians. Rather, it is a fundamental expression of human nature. A few billion dollars a year seems a small price to pay. From Hollywood, Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind arrived in movie theaters in 1977. Carl Sagan had reached enormous popularity, and his television show, Cosmos, A Personal Voyage, would air from September to December 1980. A JPL interoffice memo cited, Voyager 1's encounter with Saturn one month ago produced media response without parallel in the unmanned space exploration program. The total potential TV viewing audience was estimated at 100 million persons on four continents. Voyager represents traditional media reporting, where the journalists flock to get news about the mission. When public affairs worked with the journalists to provide backgrounders and hold press briefings, and the journalist became the primary communicator for science news. Shifting forward, Galileo's news coverage followed very similar patterns in the print media. Although Pioneer and Voyager completed flybys, Galileo became the first spacecraft to remain in orbit around Jupiter and send a descent probe into the atmosphere in 1995. Before reaching its destination, Galileo flew by Venus and Earth from 1990 to 1992, traveled to an asteroid in 1991, and discovered a moon on another asteroid in 1993, and also covered the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 in 1994. Galileo received extra pre-launch co news coverage because of its many unfortunate delays and cost overruns before its launch in 1989. Galileo's high-gain antenna also failed to fully open on its long voyage, and the multiple attempts to remedy the issue received coverage as well. This is an example going forward a little bit more than the slide that will come after. That was in um, published on July 22, 1996, and it's Galileo's spin on Joven moons. And it was a half-page feature, and you'll not note at the top it's nicely labeled science, um, with, with a little print underneath it that says astronomy. And looking at what's on the front page, the front page actually has information about the Olympics that year and the failure to find Transworld Airlines Flight 800's flight recorders. So this is a couple pages within the front page of the newspaper. This is a word cloud for some subset of Galileo text taken from the New York Times and Washington Post from December 3rd, 1995 to January 24th, 1996. In an attempt to gather information in new ways, I tried using this word cloud to visually interpret textual data, and it makes frequent works bigger, which can vary depending on the algorithm used to determine their importance. The next slide actually shows a more organized variation where we can see more interesting results. Here I'm going to pick out another pair of front page articles to examine a bit from December 8, 1995. From the New York Times, Wilford published probe pierces Jupiter's clouds and first interior look at planet. He quotes Dr. William O'Neill, the project manager, as being ecstatic, and Dr. Torrance Johnson, the chief project scientist, saying, this is really neat. <laughs> Wilford reminds his readers about the antenna failure that will result in fewer pictures and none before next summer, although software advances will allow the mission to complete 70% of its science objectives. The Washington Post staff writer Kathy Sawyer published, Galileo starts tour of giant planet. After six year trek, spacecraft first to transmit from Jovan skies. She poetically uses descriptions like the first tiny emissary to send messages from inside the atmosphere of an outer planet, and also kamikaze probe dispatched from the mothership. She relayed the importance of the research as understanding the planet's evolution by looking at a planet that retained more primeval characteristics like a Rosetta Stone. The article focused on the probe's path to descent like a celestial ballet, as described by William O'Neill. Sawyer also mentions a quote from Carl Sagan from a televised chat where he says, it's a very exciting moment to be alive and interested in these issues. Going back to the data from the word cloud, we see some unremarkable words like scientists or atmosphere. 
minutes gets repeated from both the orbital insertion and communications time. Billion refers to the $1.3 billion price tag and 2.3 billion miles traveled since launch. While this method gives me the common words, it turns out the uncommon descriptions seem much more interesting to see what these writers use to explain complex phenomena in so many different ways. The Galileo mission at this particular time seemed less immediate and definitive from long delays in data and images. In addition to technical issues, the federal government shut down and delayed the initial briefing from December 19th to January 22nd, which is why the articles for this particular mission range so long. Moving on to Cassini, the Cassini mission became an international endeavor between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Italian Space Agency. The Cassini spacecraft also carried the Huygens probe that would be released into the atmosphere of Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Cassini Huygens launched on October 15, 1997, and finally arrived at Saturn on June 30, 2004. Now, this is an example of a article published by John Noble Wilford in the New York Times, 31 moons now close enough to touch on June 15, 2004. This is about two weeks before uh, Cassini makes it to Saturn, and you get the initial photos from that. And I have this here because I want to point out, for newspapers, there's something called above the fold and below the fold. <laughs> above the fold, here on this particular page, while well, it is the science time, so it's still within the newspaper, but for the front page of this particular section, you have something about hair uh, restoration techniques, which apparently to the editors was more important than this preview of Saturn's moons. And also inside, and a couple pages later, I found interesting, there's an article by Kenneth Chang made, Making Science Fact, Now Chronicling Science Fiction. And it's about Donna Shirley, who managed the Mars Exploration Program and led the team that built the Mars Pathfinder rover, has become the new director for the Science Fiction Museum and Hall of Fame in Seattle. And there's some comments in there about using science fiction to excite and teach people about science. So I have this particular example because I, I like the juxtaposition of these various elements here. The 1997 Mars Pathfinder landing may have become the first event to make the groundbreaking transition into digital media and redefine how the general public learns about outer space. The New York Times reported 566 million hits in 30 days and 47 million hits as the highest number on a single day which surpassed the pre-landing estimates. Here's the artistic word cloud, and here's a more readable one. This was generated, again, from selected articles from the New York Times and Washington Post, and this time it's from June 30th, 2004 to July 3rd, 2004. Voyager rep, ooh, wrong page. By 2004, I can't just talk about the newspapers anymore as a source for information because we're firmly into the digital age. While newspapers sources decreased, I'm finding more short mentions on cable news shows and web, web publications like Space Daily. During the 64 hours around the Saturn orbit insertion period, Space Ref reported 136.6 million hits to the mission's website. When Huygens landed on Titan, ESA reported on their website that they received 919,000 visitor, external visitors and 6.8 million page views on January 15, 2005. Looking at this word cloud, Carolyn Porco, lead for the Cassini imaging team, appears because she gets quoted a lot in the news coverage. Wilford quotes her about the beauty and clarity in the black and white images as just mind-blowing, while explaining that color would have reduced the total quantity possible. Porco presented the TED Talks in October 2007. The TED conferences invite speakers to discuss ideas worth spreading, and their videos have been available online since June 2006. Her visibility on the web is a development of the digital age and that still continues to draw visitors and new comments about these amazing Im images. 
While Cassini made its own new scientific discoveries, Voyager technically claimed the new status more than a mission returning for further observation. Cassini images have also been labeled as art in some online communities and blogs. In comparison to the Hubble Space Telescope's popular, brightly colored images, Cassini images also often hold a stark quality in black and white that emphasizes the contrast and space. The Voyager mission illustrated how the mass media traditionally advanced scientific discoveries into the public understanding. The information from the press releases and briefings presented technical science that the journalists expanded upon to make the stories interesting for the public. In the process, the mass media necessarily popularized and simplified the science through real-world analogies or references. The journalists also added the human element through emotional cues and quotes. Although journalists often attributed surprise and wonder to the scientists, they also made statistic or statistical or philosoph uh, philosophical appeals for their audiences to feel wonder as well. A small robotic spacecraft hurtling millions of miles, learning something scientists had not known before, or even simple curiosity as a driving human characteristic. In addition, the images became both a source and evidence for wonder. Viewers might feel awe over the planetary snapshots, and they might also be amazed at the technological prowess necessary in obtaining the picture through robotic eyes. During Galileo, readers got continually reminded about the many disasters and news coverage upon reaching its and the news coverage upon reaching its destination seems to have had less impact without new images alongside the text. The Galileo mission coverage also seems to follow the predictable patterns driven from press release to news article during this time period. Now, a different aspect of the Galileo mission may have drastically different results, but if you've noticed, I'm pinpointing the moment of when the primary mission begins, often when the planetary encounter begins. Cassini becomes remarkable for breaking these patterns using web publishing. More information about new scientific discoveries appear on the mission website than gets followed by the national print and television media. Information sources proliferate over the web from traditional journalism to space blogs and even Twitter provides news. What does this digital transition mean? Some digital evangelists have promoted democratization through new media while others have expressed concerns about the web that have contracted in different ways. The internet allows users to choose what to view, where to view it, and whether to participate for nearly an infinite number of interests. For the publication side, writers or creators might find greater audiences online through blogs and sharing sites than traditional media. The internet, however, becomes an overwhelming in quantity and abundance. Visitors develop filters or act more selectively to manage the information deluge, which also results, narrows what they access based on their active interests. In other words, interested audiences may seek information only about their particular interests and not the wider world web. It becomes significantly harder to gauge public enthusiasm for planetary exploration when a handful of published editorials used to stimulate and indicate conversation about a relevant contemporary topic, and now the entire internet has thousands upon thousands of opinions and topics. Despite these issues, the web remains essential as a direct method to disseminate information, and science news remains strong on the web, although its sources for the public have deviated greatly from the comfortable definition of what journalism used to be. This perfectly timed talk. You have a question right here. Question. But you mentioned digital publication and the use of websites. So, from my insight is inside JPL's media relations and so forth, is that there's there's now perceived attention between traditional media and our use of web publication. Is the same time is that we NASA JPL want to market itself ourselves to traditional media. At the same time, we're also trying to sell ourselves directly to the public. And sometimes, 
from the outside perspective, those two things are seem to be in conflict. <laughs> then you don't need to answer it. <laughs> Jeff. Hi. Jeff Faust, Space Review. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation. I wanted to expand upon or maybe, maybe even challenge a little bit one of your premises towards the very end about gauging public interest and the challenge of trying to gauge public interest now in this fractured media environment. It seems in some respect it might actually be easier to track public interest because you now know how many people, you know how many hits are on a website. Um, you know, NASA can provide lots of information about how many millions of people viewed the web stream of the Curiosity Mars landing, for example. Whereas you don't know how many people read that editorial in the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, about promoting or, or taking a stand on space exploration one way or another. Can you expand on that point a little bit on, on the challenges of, of public perceptions and engaging that level of interest? Well, I can answer that a little bit with the challenges of gauging new media in general. Uh, when you say there are a lot of statistics on web hits, I could argue the same thing about newspapers and circulation numbers and subscription numbers. We may have these numbers, but they don't necessarily mean anything unless you have a good way to refine them down. Just because the Mars Pathfinder website gained 400 million hits across the period of a month, well, what do we measure that against? And hits tends to be sort of a fuzzy measuring tool. Um, we now know that hits can mean every time a person came to a website. Um, other people will instead say unique visitors as an indication of how many individual people came to the website. Um, we also don't necessarily um, have that kind of information available. So in a way, when I say it's difficult to take these numbers, how do you aggregate these numbers? How do you take the numbers from CNN, from Space Daily, from your website, and how do you know how many of these people are the same people, how many of them are different people, and like some of the other presentations we've heard this session, if there is so much interest, how has it not translated to some sort of public policy boost for planetary exploration? Good, good points all, thanks. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to, John Wetmore, I wanted to touch on a, a related angle, and that is uh, you know, when 100 million people look at something on the web, those are people that were interested in the subject and actively looking for it. But what about the 200 million people that won't see it at all because it's, it, they don't see it in the newspaper where you used to accidentally run into it and they didn't actively seek it on the web? And so how do you get – so you, you, you may be getting a better way to reach the people that are already interested in space, but completely missing the, the general public that doesn't have that interest already. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, that was pretty much the point I was trying to make at the very end of my conclusion. Just because there are direct methods for JPL and missions to reach the public, whether it's through newsletters or websites or educational material, um, how do you count those people and how do you know if those people are the same ones that will devour Space Daily every day anyway? Or is it actually a child that has never known anything about space and is now really starting to get interested? Uh, with the web, it's very difficult to know who it is that's coming to your website. I mean, the web can get some statistics off your cookies or whatever, but generally they know what computer you're using and where you're coming from in the United States or other countries maybe but they don't actually know very much about you, whether you're male or female, whether you're in the space industry or you're just a random member of the general public. So that is the difficulty with determining audience anymore. How do you reach the people that you know hasn't seen this before versus the audience that you know is definitely interested because they're subscribing to your newsletters now and they're coming to your websites during these big events? I'm going to ask you guys to sta keep standing because we're going to have a panel discussion now, but stay with there. You'll get a chance. And also, I know Lindley had a question about asteroids. So I want to invite my panelists to come up and to have a seat. 
Don't, I do want to bring another voice to this discussion, though, because we've been talking about public perceptions, and we have been talking about our perceptions of the public, but the public isn't really here. We're all people who are involved somehow. And I wanted to share with you a, an actual statement from somebody from the public, which is short. Um, it was written after the Curiosity Landing, and it was sent to President Obama who sent it to Jim Green, who then shared it with me. And I contacted this young person and said, can I share it with this group? Because we're going to be talking about public perceptions of NASA. So I want to read this to you so that you hear a, the current public's voice. This is not ancient history or like us, <laughs> but this is current. All right, This is a young man. And um, he says, Dear President Obama, I just wanted to let you know how much curiosity successful landing on Mars means to me. The fact that any organization in the world could send a one-ton mobile research platform to Mars and land it safely, much less using a hovering rocket-propelled sky crane, is a triumph of human intelligence, civilization, and cooperation. The fact that it was our National Aeronautics and Space Administration makes me more proud to be an American than anything has in a long time. What truly inspires me about this mission, however, is not the flawless success the NASA scientists and engineers achieved last night, or the staggering technological advances that have been fueled by similar exploration. Rather, it is the unbridled joy and the unity I have seen on the faces of the crying, hugging members of Mission Control in countless celebratory internet posts and an excited conversation with people this morning. I am 20 years old, and the only times I can remember feeling as close to my fellow Americans as I do now have been during national tragedies. The unifying effect of scientific expeditions like the Curiosity and the Apollo landings is incredibly powerful, all the more so because it is born out of triumphant national success rather than sorrow. Please continue to fund NASA and its expeditions. In so many ways, we lift ourselves up when we shoot for the stars. Sincerely, Isaac Larkin. Beyond the nationalism in the statement, which is laudable, I think it touches on the unif unifying themes that this brings to all of humanity. N like Apollo did, that wasn't just the US, although it was, but people around the world were looking at the moon and knowing that humans were walking on the moon. People around the world were looking at Mars when we were landing on Mars. And I, I think that that, I that is an aspect that we need to keep in mind. That's what touches people. We're talking about people here. And if you noticed on her word clouds, scientists appeared a lot. And I think it's because it's people. So uh, you know, we're at a, we're at a turning point here um, for planetary exploration. Um, we've been at turning points in the past, as we heard from John Logston and others. Uh, nevertheless, we are at a turning point right now. And uh, we, we know from letters like this that the public the public perceives planetary exploration as a priority for NASA. It's a question in my mind whether NASA perceives planetary exploration as a priority for NASA. Uh, we have a choice whether or not we can have another 50 fabulous years doing amazing planetary exploration or whether we will retreat to being monkeys in a dark box. <laughs> and with that, we're going to open this up for all these questions. Hello, I'm actually going to slide this because I can't see any of you. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, this is just more of a follow-up to the social media, and I just wanted to um, follow up on the person who asked the question about uh, tracking in, um, in a digital age. So I work in digital media at National Geographic, um, and I, I would argue that it's incredibly, it's so much easier to track impact now and meaning than it was back when you just had a one-way communication. You don't know the impact. I think it's, it's very difficult to track the impact of journalism generally on the public. Um, just last night, we had Bill Nye, the science guy, hosting an event at National Geographic. And uh, 
for all intents and purposes, you would think he's like not relevant to more recent generations, but how many people stood up in the audience and said, you changed my life, you're the reason I'm in science, you're the reason I'm an engineer right now, you're the reason I'm you know, studying what I'm studying, or just tonight you've changed my mind to go study something else. And, and you know, public figures like him and, and journalism will never know how many people those stories inspired. I remember Voyager being covered in every, like it might not have been one story I read, but the collective impact of Voyager had an impact. And that's very hard to measure. But in social, we can actually measure that engagement now. We know how many people are talking about it, who are commenting on it, who are sharing it. We know the extended impact of that. We can track with social flow, the whole, like we have this unbelievable, almost too much information about how much engagement and sharing is happening. So I would just kind of, I would bring that in and, and factor it in more as a commentary, because I do think the tools are out there. We do know demographics. We do know exactly yeah. where everybody lives. So. That's great, thank you. I will comment a little bit about that, and that's the fact that I am kind of looking retroactively at historical events, despite the fact that 2004 was not that far back into history. <laughs> so right now, yeah, I can look at Google Trends and other tools that tell me lots of things about what people are searching for, and that's great. But I can't go back to even 2004 and necessarily pull up the same kind of data and that's what I mean by it's really difficult to determine audience. And as a historian, I will probably always have this question unless I kind of look forward in the future and start storing away this stuff. So uh, just a clarification of what I mean by the difficulty in it. Greg? I wanted to uh, offer a tangible example of something that Susan Poulton uh, just said from the National Geographic. Uh, from my own recent experience of, of uh, understanding the impact of the social media. The week after Curiosity landed, I just happened to be here in town having dinner with Susan, and we were talking about the, uh, about the events over at Nat Geo, which we had last night. Susan is the Vice President for the Digital Media Division of uh, National Geographic, so she knows a lot about this stuff. And over the course of dinner, uh, she said, hey, by the way, have you seen this latest YouTube thing that just came out today? And she pulls out her iPhone and she fires it up and it's, we're NASA and we know it. It had 382 hits and I suspect most of you have seen it by this time. The next morning I wake up in my hotel room and I said, geez, I got to go get that link and see what that, and see it again, you know, now that I'm awake and sober and such. And by that time it was already up to 300,000. And I don't know what it is at this point. But I mean, things like that, that we do that are so exciting, that can capture people's imagination, can go viral. Yeah. And as Susan ha told me, the key to making this happen is just get the stuff out there, get the information out there, let people, let the people out there in the country take it and run with it. That's great, thanks. Very powerful. Yeah. Janet, sorry. Hi, Janet Vertessi, Princeton University. Um, that's great, you discovered NASA and we know it, uh, that Link has been out there for a good six months, though, so it may be that you're seeing different versions. As someone who works in human-computer interaction and publishes in that domain, I'd also like to make it clear that there's different versions of tweeting and retweeting. We all know the difference between different kinds of friends, and it's that qualitative assessment of what it is people are doing with digital material that I think is also, I'm really glad you pointed that out, because I think that's very tricky to get at, despite the numbers of counts one can get. It's very different than the qualitative experience. But that leads into my question, which has to do with the construction of various publics and there's something about the use of the monolithic term public again that is effacing the fact that these media and these personages whether they're uh, whether you're making a film or whether you're uh, um, or whether you're a reporter that you're not just re seamlessly reporting or seamlessly producing something but you're also producing a particular public and a particular audience and I'd really like to know a little more about the fine distinctions between, you know, if you're writing for the New York Times, it's very different than if you're writing for uh, Science, da Science Daily, it's very different than the big spreads on Voyager yeah. that I remember seeing on National Geographic when I was a child. Um, if you're producing, you know, documentary films, it's very different than if you're producing Deep Impact, et cetera. So I'd really like to know a little bit more about the fine grained distinctions in publics um, that NASA is speaking to and the variety of different media that they're using to do that. Thank you for that, because it's actually far more detail that I would go into in a paper, but wouldn't be able to do in a presentation. And I try to meet that challenge by trying to go across a variety of major national papers. Mm -hmm. So today I think I talked about the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the LA Times. 
Um, I took a variety of more papers than that to try to get more of an aggregate sample with different kinds of audiences. And I recognize that a newspaper reading audience is often a somewhat more educated audience who wants to pay attention to what's happening in the news. So in and of itself, I've limited the public to that particular sub-segment that is either reading the paper or watching the nightly news, which is actually most of the hits that I get for even Voyager coverage. It's the evening news from the three major networks. Um, from that, uh, there's also things like the magazines you mentioned, like National Geographic. I can look in Newsweek, which is definitely a different audience than National Geographic. Um, I actually do tend to stay away from the more specialized publications like Aviation Week because I know that that audience is very self-selected in wanting to see that news. So I've even looked at um, kind of not so great newspapers like USA Today to see if they do mention um, these missions at all because it's a great source that's a quick, easy read and it's found in hotels all around the United States. So I do kind of toss around the public in my presentation a lot without making this specification that it's a very special public that chooses to keep up on national news and chooses to keep themselves informed. To answer your question more generally, I think NASA is very aware of the different audiences that are out there, and they do track things like USA Today, Public News, I mean, the New York, they were working on the Times Square because they know they're reaching a different audience exactly. in Times Square than they would in the New York Times. <laughs> so they're very aware of that, and that, that factors in. Let's keep going so we get a few more questions in. And I know, Lindley, you were very patient last time, so I'm going to call on you now. Thanks. Uh, Lindley Johnson, your local planetary asteroid defense officer. Uh, <laughs> the question is going to be for Laura, but I also appreciate uh, the thoughts of the rest of you. Uh, Laura, you, you pointed out that uh, the public doesn't seem to be worried about the, about the asteroid threat. And I'd like your thoughts on uh, um, how much that perception might be influenced uh, by the storyline that you, you see in all these popular movies and, and, and fiction stories that, uh, that uh, as you pointed out, the public seems to think NASA has all this money uh, and we can do anything. Uh, you know, we can land a one-ton spacecraft on, on, on the surface of Mars. Uh, and the storyline uh, always gets to a happy ending, you know, that NASA might be trials and tribulations, but we always save the day. And so how much do you think uh, public perception uh, that public perception comes from from uh, always the happy ending to the to the to the movie. Well, um, it's it's a little bit more complex than that in the sense that I I'm uh, I'm using those examples to read public perception. So I don't think they are driving public perception. I think it's a feedback loop where, as an audience, this is what we expect, and so that's what Hollywood gives us. So, um, you know, I I think that. So you, so you think there's this expectation on the public that NASA is going to be there to save the day? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. They may not know about many of the, NASA, of the things that NASA does. They're surprised every time, you know, the general public that's not, that doesn't follow space all that well, um, that kind of the segment on the public. But I think if they knew that that threat was coming, they would think, they would be pretty sure they would bet that NASA would solve it. We're a victim of our own success. So yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm, it, it, I, it's always a, an interesting bar uh, conversation when I tell people what I do, and 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 they, they talk about uh, you know well NASA's you know obviously got the uh, wherewithal and the and the material to you know to prevent this and. And uh, uh, it's always an interesting perception from them when I tell them that, no, we really, <laughs> we really don't. At best, we might be able to find them right now. <laughs> I think, though, it's clear that um, the public perception is that NASA has a whole lot of really smart people. And if they discover an asteroid coming in, that NASA would marshal its resources and put all those real smart people on the, on the subject and try to get something done. And I talk about this a lot in public lectures. and. Um, you know, even though one of your conclusions was that education is not the answer, 
I think that was sort of what you said. I have found that people honestly don't know about things like comet impacts, asteroid impacts. Um, they get those little wake-up calls, like you said, and then they kind of drift back into complacency. But I do want to say that you know, there were things that were threats. And I want to make this analogy and maybe have you comment on it. Um, people didn't used to wear seat belts, ever. Like when I was a kid, you know, throw all the kids in the back of the car and drive off. But now everybody wears seat belts, all right, because we've learned yeah. that it is important for saving lives. What? Do you think there's an analogy? Well, one, one is my conclusion was not that we should stop the education effort. Please, <laughs> please let me clarify that. I think NASA should continue to educate because we have to, because a learned society is a worthy goal, and, and you know, we have to continue that. But I, I, what I meant to say was that if the goal is to drive public policy change, then you, know, you may find that education may not lead you to that. Education in and of itself will be a worthy goal, but maybe it won't lead to the public policy change that you want. Mm -hmm. that, that was the point. Okay. Um, but also on the threat, again, it's, this is a very unique threat. It's not car collisions. It's not an, you will see accidents. We've all seen car accidents. We have not all seen a, a really um, a big catastrophic we all asteroid most impact. Most people had seen an asteroid impact, but not not a you know not, not one big, that will scare they you. They don't connect the two. Yeah. So, so you know, in the literature, you will find that scientists are very aware of you know crying wolf, and if they start saying you know blowing up the threat and saying that you know uh, comets and asteroids do impact the Earth every day, and you know therefore a real big impact can come at any moment, um, you know they could be crying wolf, and the public may not like that because then they will be proven wrong and and they may not believe that message. So it's, again, it's also not saying that that, that effort should be discontinued, but it's that there, there's a challenge there and that I don't think that just talking about the issue and trying to explain it the best way you can will solve that. Yeah. I just want to make sure I bring Linda in the discussion by mentioning the Andromeda strain, you know, where we combine the impacts and the microbes yeah, together. I to just uh, uh, <laughs> we'll get to you. I'm going to hint first. Laura's assessment of this issue because there's, there's a small, uh, credible body of research in science and risk communication that explains how informing and educating non-expert audiences about science and risk may not have the effect that you desire. In other words, the more informed that a non-expert becomes, about a scientific or technological issue that um, is a potential hazard or risk, um, the more they may decide this is a problem they don't want to deal with. It could go, you know, it could go either way. So my feeling, personally, as a scholar and as a citizen, I think that it's an obligation um, on the part of um, federal agencies and federally funded researchers like myself. Uh, to inform anybody who wants to know about the work that we do, everything we do know. It's, you know, we're doing this in the public interest, but it, education is not the key. It doesn't solve all your problems. Yeah. Okay. Question. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Williams. I'm, uh, I work in Jim Green's shop as the EPO guy, but I'm, my, uh, I'm a detailee from the National Air and Space Museum where I was chair of education. So I've been working for the last 10 years with the general public, and I really wanted to resonate on uh, the discussion going back to, to Greg and, and some of the previous uh, uh, responses in how the public, uh, how we deal with the public. We are trying to drive public perceptions. Okay, we do a great job with the specialist to be in their educational process. Our good students are as good as they ever were, and they're as uh, plentiful as they ever were. But we're doing a progressively less good job, in my opinion, in dealing with the public. Uh, in, in the non-specialist. Now, I've seen a private universe and some of these other things, uh, jaywalking. Uh, there are people, who, uh, most people, at least in the United States, have a fundamental misunderstanding of basic science. And if you're going to use a risk assessment argument, uh, you're talking to people who live on the San Andreas Fault in the shadow of uh, Mount St. Helens and uh, who actually believe that if they roll sevens three times in a row, they're never going to roll a seven again. Uh, you know, Las Vegas pays a lot of electrical bills on these kinds of misperceptions. So uh, my point is that uh, we have to do the same thing any kind of a mass uh, audience entertainment thing does. The reason that they have the little kid with a crummy telescope discover the killer asteroid is because the audience would never identify with a real scientist doing a real study using real equipment. That's foreign to them. They've got to feel like they're part of 
the part uh, participatory exploration process in learning as well as space exploration. In our day, the baby boomers, I'll be quick, uh, wanted to use role models to stimulate their imaginations. But young people today don't do that. They're more attuned to mechanical assistance, electronic assistance to the exploration process. So by approaching it that way, and the social media is a big help with that, is a big deal. The one comment I feel that more than any other since Curiosity landed was, how cool is NASA these days? They landed a one-ton craft on Mars, and one of the guys that did it was wearing a mohawk, okay? Never mind any of the science. They could identify with that, and that's what I would like to leave you with. Sorry that's I was good. wrong. Can, now we have time for just two very brief comments, or questions would be even better. Please. Okay, I just thought it be, might be useful to add a couple of numbers to the conversation that uh, <clears throat> Much of the conversation in this entire session has been limited to the United States, uh, but there is a self-selected group of people out there, members of the Planetary Society in 100 countries. The Planetary Society exploded from nothing to 100,000 members at its founding. Uh, there are not that many now, but they're still in 100 countries, uh, and it uh, costs them $45 a year if they're not in the U.S., 35 if they're here, I think. But uh, I think it's relevant to the whole conversation to introduce the international element here. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I've been involved in since I retired from JPL is the International Space University, which just celebrated its 25th anniversary over across town. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see the conversation continue to include this other public that's out there. Uh, I realize that they don't have as much influence, perhaps no influence, on what happens in Congress or whatever, uh, but they are important because they're supporters. Yep, that's, thank you very much for those comments. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to echo that and, and remark that the Planetary Society's current vision is to cultivate a global culture that explores our Earth and other worlds. So it, it, the Planetary Society is very much aware of that, and I encourage you all to engage with that organization. Yes, please, last yes, question. Thank you, Heidi. I'm John Sarkissian from CSRO. This is to, to Linda. Linda, I just want to applaud your efforts um, in um, correcting the pub public record about the, um, the, the bacteria that was found on the Apollo 12 camera. <laughs> Um, as someone who works at Parks and has been researching the role of the Apollo missions over the last decade and a half, um, the film Capricorn One has a lot to answer for. <laughs> and, um, you know, once a, narr a narrative takes hold in the public mind, it, it's very, very difficult to, to correct that misconception. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, um, and so any effort to correct the public record and bring things back to the truth is, is fantastic and I applaud your efforts on that. Um, also, I think NASA was founded partly to, to boost public morale in the United States and, and um, um, to demonstrate American um, leadership um, in science and technology and in many ways it's become a victim of its own success. Um, so, you know, when, when something they do, NASA does do spectacular things like land people on the, on the moon and rovers on Mars and so on. And so when something does threaten the Earth, it's only natural that people go to the, to the organisation that has a proven record of success to do that. And so, um, um, and it's, I don't think it's, a, it's a, an accident that Deep Impact in Armageddon um, appeared just two or three years after the Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 impacts on Jupiter um, and NASA's fantastic um, PR in publicising that to the world with the Hubble images and, and so on. Um, so, um, you know, I, again, Lynn, I do applaud your, your efforts in, in correcting that, that record. Thank you for your comments, but I want to say involved. I was having a little problem coordinating my brain with my remote finger and somehow or other didn't show my acknowledgement slide. So there were a lot of people who, who collected oh, the I information. That, yeah. I did a lot of reading and a lot of research myself, but um, they're all acknowledged in the paper. So thank you all. Thank you to my panelists. Um, and it's been very interesting. And I'm turning this over to Greg.
Thank you, Heidi, and the gang of three pale but certainly not stale ladies. That was a very stimulating uh, conversation, and in fact, the whole, the whole day has been. I think we should thank all of our panelists and all of our speakers. So, so Bill asked me if I might say a few words to kind of wrap up uh, today as we segue over to the reception here. And uh, my mind has been expanded. I mean, setting aside the fact that I'm a member of the, you know, the uh, program committee that put this together, it, this has exceeded my expectations uh, tremendously. And I think the fact that everybody is still glued to their seats since 8.30 this morning and still raring to go says we probably all feel the same way. I don't know how you wrap up a day like this because we've covered so much uh, territory and we've all learned so much uh, from it uh, that it would probably take a day to wrap the whole thing up, you know, just to, to the past day. I did want to, uh, to share with you one major insight that I got from, uh, from today's conversations uh, that I didn't really appreciate up until today. And I say that in spite of the fact that I've personally had a passion for solar system exploration for all of my life. In fact, I have to tell the story. I was first uh, caught, I guess I should say, bitten by the bug of insatiable curiosity at the tender age of seven. It was a starry summer night in rural Indiana. My brother and sister and I were in the back seat of my dad's uh, Packard convertible. The top was down. We were on our way home from a drive-in movie theater. Our heads were on the back you know, looking up at the starry skies, the, you know, the spectacular Milky Way overhead because the skies were really dark then. And Heidi, a spectacular bolide went streaming overhead, exploded into two pieces with a loud boom, sparks flying out of it. It was unbelievable. So in unison, I'm sure my brother and sister and I all said the same thing. Dad, what was that? My father was a, me a metallurgical engineer and a great fan of science fiction. And uh, we had been seeing science fiction movies from a tender age. But to his credit, he answered responsibly that night. <laughs> he said, son, I don't think it was a spaceship. Why don't we go to the library tomorrow and we'll start researching it? And I've had this passion, and I'm sure that virtually everybody in this audience has as well. So uh, getting new insights you know, at this time, at this phase of my career, I, I'm, I'm really impressed by that. The thing that really hit me today is uh, we all agree how fantastic it is what we do, but I've come to appreciate even more just how tenuous our fate is. And I think that when Jason uh, Callahan gave his marvelous uh, 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 background this, uh, this morning, that's when it really hit me. I mean, we've had the ups and downs, we've had the lost decade, and you know, it really takes a perfect alignment of three major constituencies to keep us on this track. We got the folks who are the, well, they're, they're really four, Jim is right. I'll get to the fourth one in a minute. One of them is on Capitol Hill. Another is at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. There's a constituency within NASA, the senior leadership. When they're all aligned and the public, the fourth, is behind all of this, fantastic things happen. But what we have seen through the history of the past 50 years is most of the time they're not all aligned. And I've realized today from our conversations that the thing that sees us through those periods of time and the reason that we're still here is the leadership that our community has produced, the people with a vision, with a moxie, with a savvy, the passion, and I should say the savvy to know how to use it in order to beat back the odds and keep things going. Most of them are actually in this room here today, or they have been, and I personally want to say thank you Thank you very much, and I'm looking at two of them right now, for what you have done to keep this enterprise alive. And I think that as long as we can continue to do the exciting things that we have been doing, Curiosity on Mars, all of the new things that are in the pipeline, we will continue to inspire the next generation of leaders like the folks in this room who will keep us going. That's what we're going to need, because times are going to be tough, and we've got to keep doing the exciting stuff. So. Um, I wanted to say one other thing. I mean, this has been a magical day for a lot of reasons, but I think several of us commented before that when you put together historians and sociologists and scientists, really cool things happen. Who would have thought? And I think we owe a, a big debt of gratitude to NASA's chief historian, Bill Berry, and to the National Air and Space Museum chief historian, 
Roger Lanius. who had the vision to bring together this diverse, eclectic group of people. We were starting to think about doing something out in Pasadena. It would have been just a bunch of scientists sitting around talking. You guys have really made this thing successful, and I thank you. So uh, with that, let's see, Bill. I'll take the second to disavow any credit for uh, this thing. It's a, it's a very big team effort, so thanks to everybody for the help. Um, Two quick announcements. One, uh, there's been a lot of talk about planetary protection this afternoon. We actually produced a book about planetary protection last year called uh, When Biospheres Collide uh, in the NASA History Program. And uh, I'm sorry that I didn't think to bring some copies over because we have some copies of other books we've done. So we'll try and get some copies of planet, that planetary protection book over here tomorrow. Anybody wants a copy, feel free to help yourself. Okay, so paid uh, announcement about our products uh, over with. Let's turn to the reception. Those of you who um, uh, sign up for the reception. You're welcome to join us on the far side of the lobby over there in the Space Experience Center. Um, you'll be given a, a ticket for a drink, and if you want more than one drink, you're going to have to buy it yourself. There'll be a cash bar available there. Um, if you're a civil servant and you've uh, accepted more than $50 worth of uh, things from Lucky Martin uh, in the last year, uh, you should hand some money over to um, <coughs> Kelly. You want to stand up for us? Kelly, Victor French back there, our intern, is going to be manning the table, and there'll be some of the folks over there too. They'll be happy to take uh, cash or a check from you to, to cover any difference there. Or if, you, or if you're a political appointee and you're required to do that, um, the rules have changed a lot thanks to our friends uh, uh, who have had some issues with uh, conferences in the last couple of years. So please be careful about it, uh, attending to those issues. Um, enjoy the evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>